Hello and welcome to HIVRNA Test Guide Podcast, your trusted source for HIV testing, with over 4,500 plus testing labs across the United States. Okay, let's unpack this. We're diving deep into something that, well, it really became a flashpoint during the pandemic, didn't it? Oh, absolutely. That comparison of vaccine research timelines. Exactly. Yeah. So the question we're tackling for you today is pretty fundamental. Why did we get a COVID-19 vaccine so quickly, relatively speaking, when we still don't have really effective vaccines for HIV or uh, cancer or even the common cold after decades of work? Yeah, and this comparison, you saw it all over social media, it works entirely by... Um by basically ignoring the fundamental biology. Right. So our mission here is to break down the, let's call it, errors in logic when you lump these totally different illnesses together. Because the speed for the COVID vaccine, while amazing science, it doesn't really say anything about solving these other much more complex biological puzzles, does it? Not at all. It's comparing apples and, well, not even oranges, apples and something completely different. We've looked at sources from major fact checkers, Reuters, AFP, places like that, who dug into this. And the skeptical phrasing they found was always kind of similar. It went something like, so wait, 40 years, no HIV vaccine, 100 years, no cancer vaccine, but one year, poof, a COVID vaccine. Something feels off. And that framing, it implies, you know, that either scientists just decided to focus on COVID, maybe ignored the others, or worse, that the process was somehow rushed or fraudulent. Which isn't the case. Absolutely not. The reality is you just cannot compare the research path for a uh, relatively standard virus like SARS-CoV-2 to a multifaceted disease like cancer or a retrovirus like HIV that's constantly changing. The hurdles are just fundamentally different. Totally different, not comparable, really. Okay, so let's start with maybe the most uh, jarring comparison in that list, cancer. Why is comparing a potential cancer vaccine timeline to a viral vaccine like COVID's just? Why does it not make sense? Well, the scientific difference is just immense. When we talk about cancer, we're not usually talking about a single bug, you know, a virus or bacterium you catch from someone else. Right. It's not typically communicable like that. Exactly. Cancer is really a collection of diseases, hundreds of them, all defined by your own cells growing uncontrollably. And the causes are varied genetics, radiation, chemicals. Sometimes viruses, though, right? That's an important nuance. Yes, absolutely. Certain viruses like HPV, human papillomavirus, dramatically increase the risk for specific cancers. That's a key point. But the disease itself, the cancer, is the body's own cells malfunctioning. So if you think of it as a failure of our own cellular machinery, not necessarily a single outside invader, then the whole idea of what a vaccine needs to do changes completely. How so? Well, for most cancers, you're not trying to prime the immune system against an external threat like a virus particle. You're trying to train it to recognize and attack the body's own cells that have gone rogue, become malignant. That's a fundamentally different and arguably much harder biological task. Immensely harder. And that social media post implies, you know, 100 years of research got us nowhere. But our sources, the fact checkers, they push back hard on that. They point out we do have vaccines that reduce cancer risk and even some that treat existing cancer. Can you walk us through that? Yes, that's crucial. There are different types of cancer vaccines. First, you have prophylactic ones, preventative. The HPV vaccine is the prime example. Okay. HPV causes most cervical cancers plus throat, anal cancers. The vaccine prevents the HPV infection itself. So no infection, much, much lower risk of those cancers. That's a huge win. So we do have a vaccine against a major cause of cancer, but it hits the virus first. Precisely. Then you have therapeutic vaccines. These are designed to treat cancer that's already there. How do those work? Sounds complex. It is. The basic idea is to stimulate the patient's own immune system to fight their specific cancer. This might involve taking parts of the tumor, modifying them somehow, and using that to train the immune cells. And do we have any successful ones? Yes. The sources mention an approved therapeutic vaccine for advanced prostate cancer, and there are others in trials looking promising for melanoma, lung cancer. So that claim of no vaccine for cancer, it's just flat out wrong. Dangerously misleading, even. Okay, that distinction between tackling a faulty cell process versus a foreign invader really clarifies the cancer part. But let's shift to HIV. Now, this is a virus like COVID-19. Right. Yet, 40 years of intense research, still no broadly effective vaccine. 
This is where, like, the sheer biological trickiness of a virus really comes into focus. It really does. HIV is such a tough opponent because it's just incredibly good at evading everything we throw at it, including our own immune system. Yeah. There are two main biological tricks it uses. And those are the super fast mutation yeah. and its ability to hide, right? Exactly. Let's start with mutation. HIV is a retrovirus. It uses an enzyme, reverse transcriptase, to copy its RNA into the host's DNA. And this enzyme is sloppy. It makes mistakes, lots of them, every time the virus replicates. These mistakes mean the virus is constantly changing, especially its outer coat, the part the immune system usually targets. No, it's not just a moving target. It's like it changes its disguise constantly. That's a perfect analogy. Your immune system makes antibodies for virus version A, but by the time those antibodies are ready, the virus has already shifted to version B or C or D, which those antibodies don't recognize effectively. So a vaccine would need to somehow anticipate all those changes. Ideally, yes. It would need to generate what we call broadly neutralizing antibodies. Antibodies that can somehow grab onto parts of the virus that don't change much across many, many strains. That's the holy grail we haven't quite reached. Okay, that's one massive hurdle. What's the second one? The hiding. Yes, cellular latency. This is really sneaky. HIV doesn't just float around, it inserts its genetic code right into the DNA of our own immune cells, particularly T cells. Into our actual DNA. Right into it, and once it's in there, it can just sit tight, dormant, latent for years sometimes. While it's latent, it's completely invisible. Invisible to the immune system and drugs. Exactly. Immune cells can't see it, and our current antiretroviral drugs only work on actively replicating virus. They can't touch this hidden reservoir. So even if treatment clears all the active virus from the blood. These hidden reservoirs remain just waiting for a chance to reactivate and start the cycle all over again. That's profoundly different from how most viruses, including SARS-CoV-2, behave. So traditional vaccine approaches, like using a weakened or dead virus, they don't work well here. They really haven't. Using a live, weakened HIV is considered far too dangerous. There's a risk it could revert back and cause AIDS. Yikes. Okay. And using killed virus, or just pieces of the virus, the subunit approach, it just hasn't generated the kind of incredibly powerful, broad, and long-lasting immune response you'd need to stop this constantly changing hidden enemy. Right. Okay, so we've got cancer diverse, internal cellular issue, HIV tricky, Mutating hiding virus. Oh. What about the third one in that misleading comparison? Yeah. The common cold. Why no vaccine for that after all this time? Seems less scary than HIV. It does seem less scary, and thankfully it is less severe. But the challenge here isn't deception, like HIV. It's sheer numbers. Overwhelming variety. Variety? How so? The main culprit for the common cold is the rhinovirus family. And there isn't just one rhinovirus. There are over 200 known types or serotypes. No, no, wow. And that's just rhinoviruses. Other viruses cause cold symptoms too. Some coronaviruses, adenoviruses, others. So you're talking potentially hundreds of slightly different viruses causing similar symptoms. So even if you made a vaccine for, say, the top 10 cold viruses. Another one, rhinovirus number 11 or maybe coronavirus OC43, just steps in to fill the gap. An effective vaccine would need to protect against a huge number of different targets all at once. That sounds like a nightmare from a manufacturing and uh, regulatory perspective. One shot covering 200 plus things. Astronomical challenge. Plus, there's another factor. Medical necessity, or maybe the lack thereof. Meaning it's just not serious enough. Essentially, yes. Compared to COVID-19, which, you know, filled hospitals and caused widespread death, the common cold is usually just a week of feeling rough. Annoying, yes. Disruptive, yes, but rarely life-threatening for most people. So the massive global push, the funding, the urgency we saw for COVID. It just doesn't exist for the common cold. Research funding and effort naturally go towards diseases that cause much more severe illness and death. It's a matter of priorities. Okay, so if we pull this all together now, you've got these three really distinct, really massive scientific challenges. For cancer, it's the diversity of the disease, the fact it's often our own cells. Right. For HIV, it's that extreme mutation rate and the ability to hide in our cells. And for the common cold, it's just the sheer overwhelming number of different viruses involved. Right. Exactly. So the takeaway for you, the listener, is pretty clear. Comparing research timelines across these conditions without acknowledging these huge scientific differences... It's just a basic logical fallacy. It doesn't work. It doesn't. COVID-19, while 
obviously serious, was caused by a coronavirus. That's yeah. A family of viruses scientists had been studying for decades thanks to SARS and MERS. We had a head start, in a way. We did. And crucially, technologies like mRNA vaccines weren't invented overnight for COVID. They'd been developed over many years, just waiting for the right moment, the right target. So the knowledge base and the tools were kind of simmering, ready to go? Precisely. The rapid COVID vaccine development wasn't magic. It was decades of prior research hitting the right problem at a time of unprecedented global focus and funding. Cancer, HIV, the common cold, they just don't offer that same kind of relatively stable known target. So when you see those kinds of posts online making that comparison. You can now pinpoint why it's wrong. You can ask, what specific biological hurdle is being ignored here? Is it the cellular complexity, the mutation? the sheer number of variants. Understanding that nuance is key to pushing back against misinformation, yeah. right? having the actual scientific reason. Absolutely. It arms you with facts, not just feelings or suspicions. Public health really depends on people sharing reliable information, not misleading comparisons. It really makes you think, though, when you consider just how hard it is to make even a universal flu vaccine, which also mutates, but maybe not as widely as HIV. Yeah. It just highlights the incredible difficulty in creating effective treatments or preventions for so many conditions. Each one has its own unique set of challenges. It really underscores the complexity for biology and the ingenuity needed for medical breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. Definitely something to chew on. So maybe the final thought for you is this. The next time you see one of those sweeping comparisons about science taking too long for one thing versus another, pause and ask yourself, what unique, maybe non-comparable scientific factor is likely being glossed over in that argument? What's the nuance they're missing? Yeah, asking that question, what's different here biologically, that usually mm -hmm. leads you to a much more accurate understanding.